It's shocking how many things a baby requires. Or at least it's shocking how many things I think a baby requires. I admit they might not all be necessary, you know, first time parent. Packing these days is a whole ordeal. Gone are the days when I could throw my things into a neat little carry-on and just walk right on the plane. Now there are bags. There are bags, plural. Bags filled with diapers and bottles and teeny tiny clothes and crinkly books and, of course, Theo's lovey. It's a little like half rabbit, half blanket thing, of which we have five. Remember, I admit, they might not all be necessary, but we have five, just in case one or two or three or four go missing over the course of his childhood, we have backups. Theo has his lovey, I had my blankie, a baby blanket that I practically loved into non-existence over the course of my own childhood. It just slowly started disintegrating into nothing. Maybe you grew up with something similar, a, a teddy bear, some sort of transitional object. That's the official psychological term, transitional object. An item that helps to soothe anxiety in the absence of a parent or caregiver. Transitional objects provide a sensory reminder to the child that they are loved and cared for. One way of understanding the golden calf in today's story is as a transitional object. We might be more familiar with the interpretation of the golden calf as a new God, a different one than the almighty God that the Israelites have been following. But another, and perhaps even more likely scenario, is that the calf was not created as a totally new replacement God, but as a symbol as a transitional object for the Israelites in what they perceive to be divine absence. Let's back up for a moment to understand how we got here. As many of you know, we've been following the narrative lectionary this fall, working our way through major stories in the Hebrew Bible. A quick little plug for that insert you've been getting in your bulletin. It has daily readings listed throughout the week if you want a little help connecting from Sunday to Sunday. The last we heard, we were still in the book of Genesis with Joseph and his brothers. Joseph the dreamer, Joseph with the fabulous coat. Joseph ends up reunited with his brothers. He forgives them for the harm they have caused, and his powerful ability to interpret dreams saves lives during a period of famine. Joseph goes on to have his own family and grow into old age. And then the Israelites, as a people, they continue to grow as well. So much so that over time, they began to threaten the new pharaoh of Egypt. This brings us into the book of Exodus. The Israelites are enslaved in Egypt, and Moses arises as a leader for the people. With God's guidance and divine assistance, Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt and into the wilderness. The Israelites, while initially glad to be out of slavery, are not having a great time in the wilderness. 
They're hungry. They're tired. And they're uncertain of where they're going and how long it's going to take to get there. Ahead of where today's scripture starts, they finally arrive at Mount Sinai, where they receive the Ten Commandments. And they celebrate the covenant. God promises to be their God, and they promise to be God's people. Moses then goes back up the mountain to talk a little more with God. And while he is gone, the Israelites start freaking out. They are highly anxious. Because they don't know how long Moses is going to be gone. And they still aren't sure what exactly is going to happen to them. So it is out of this anxiety that they ask Moses' brother and fellow prophet Aaron to give them a calf to make for them an idol. Again, not necessarily as a replacement for God, but as like a security blanket. Something tangible that provides immediate satisfaction. Yet, in doing so, they break a commandment. Not commandment two, you shall have no other gods before me, but commandment three, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth below, or that is in the water beneath, you shall not bow down to them or worship them. Idols are things that we worship instead of God, in the name of God. It can be something that we elevate to the position of a new God. But it can also be something that initially represents God and that over time comes to take God's place or distract us from our true relationship with the divine. That's what happens for the Israelites. They create this idol and they confuse it for God. It's like confusing the lovey for the mom or the blankie for the dad and starting to go to that item not as a touchstone but as the source itself. Idols are often created out of anxiety or fear. We create them when we feel alone or threatened or like things are just taking too long. We create them when we're in the wilderness and we want instant gratification. An idol is something that we worship instead of God in the name of God. For the Israelites, that was the golden calf. There are all sorts of contemporary examples. Money is a primary one. Or stuff. Maybe one piece of stuff in particular, or just the accumulation of it. Many of us turn to money or stuff as a way to soothe our anxiety and fear of the future. Christian nationalism, that's another one. Worshiping the idea that this country and its government should be controlled by a singular supremacist theology. But remember that idols can also start out as reminders of God that over time become privileged over God or distract from our relationship with God. I think this is where idolatry can be particularly tricky, especially now. Things like the church as an institution, 
clergy, traditions, buildings, things that are lovely and meaningful but are not God themselves. Idols cannot provide what God can provide. Idols cannot do what God can do. As gratifying as an idol might be in the short term, an idol cannot love us, can't forgive us, and it certainly, certainly cannot save us. Well, and there's the little fact that idolatry angers God. God is distressed by the creation of the golden calf. And while a story that involves God's anger may in turn be distressing or uncomfortable to us, it's important to acknowledge this part of the narrative. God is angry here. And let's understand that. Right? God has just brought the Israelites out of slavery. God has just brought the Israelites out of bondage. And they've just had an entire celebration acknowledging their covenant and promise to one another. It's like a big wedding party. But literally, while the ink is not yet dry on the Ten Commandments, the Israelites go and they create a golden calf. And come on! Of course, God is distressed and angry. This is the lowest point of God's relationship with the Israelites. That's the lowest point. God is so fed up that God wants to be done with them altogether. Thankfully, God decides not to act on it. God is reminded through Moses of God's promises to the Israelites. God is reminded and brought back to the covenant. And God decides to uphold it, even though the people have not. Even when God is angry, God holds fast. God stays true. God loves. Even when God is feeling betrayed. We don't know what we're doing half the time. Our idolatry often starts out innocuously maybe even with good intentions. But over time, we lose the thread and we don't know what we're doing. We aren't aware of how much we're hurting God. We aren't aware of how much we're hurting others. We don't know what we're doing. Jesus recognizes this in his final moments. Jesus, in his crucifixion, looks at the people around him, the people who are killing him, and who are killing one another. Something that we, as humans, still keep on doing. And Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. We often don't know what we're doing, or we don't understand the full impact of it, or we do know what we're doing, but we just aren't sure how to stop. And that is why we're here, right? We're here to acknowledge that we aren't perfect. And we're here to know and be reminded that we're forgiven. We're here to be called back, just like God was called back, just like the Israelites were called back to our true relationship with God. We're here as people who are stiff-necked and hard-headed and don't know what we're doing, but who want to keep trying. 